Okay. Thank you everyone for attending the keynote speaker, uh, sorry, keynote panel for the uh, second day of uh, Cal OER this year. Uh, my name is Delmar Larson. I'm professor of chemistry at the University of California, Davis and director of the LibreText project. And I'm pleased to host this keynote panel. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the sponsors for this uh, workshop. That includes the Open Education Research uh, Resources Initiative from the Academic Senate for the California Community Colleges, uh, LibreText, the Mickelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, the California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, and ICSME. Next slide, please. Today, we have four individuals who are going to be talking about the non-financial aspects associated with OER. Historically, the success of OER has been measured as dollars saved or open textbooks adopted. While these are clearly desirable outcomes, they beg the larger question of why OER. In this session, we will consider the case for OER beyond affordability. How is the case of OER evolving and can OER help teachers and learners achieve these, uh, these goals and other goals? We have uh, Angela DeBarger from the Hewlett Foundation, Rajiv Jean Gianni, I always mispronounce his name, I apologize for that, <laughs> now at Brock University, uh, Joy Shoemate uh, at College of the Canyons, and Kira uh, Kirisu from, just graduated from the College of the Canyons, now is uh, a student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and she's currently taking a class, so she'll be represented via YouTube videos. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to uh, the panelists in order to introduce themselves. Angela, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, so hi, everyone. As uh, Del Mar shared, I'm a program officer at the Hewlett Foundation, and I've been at Hewlett now about five years, um, and I still feel relatively new to OER coming into the field maybe about seven or eight years ago. And um, my entry point was in work that we were doing around project-based learning, uh, where we were collaborating with teachers to build these courses that we really wanted students to connect what they're learning in school with that was happening in their lives, in their communities. And it was through that work I learned about OER. It made a ton of sense to me that we would wanna openly license these courses so that teachers and students could make them their own. And I've been hooked ever since. And so now at Hewlett, I get to work with a variety of teams from the higher education space to K-12 and even some work globally. So lots of exciting stuff going on. Thank you, Rajiv. Sure. Thanks, Dalma. Uh, it's lovely to be with you all. Um, I want to first acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional uh, lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples in Ontario, Canada, um, where I currently serve as the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Brock University. Um, Angela, you mentioned seven or eight years. I'm on day four of this job, so I'm very new to this, of course, but uh, uh, until July 31st for the past 15 years, I was uh, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, where I was in a similar role leading teaching and learning and open education work. And so it's a real treat to, to be with you all. Great, thank you, Rajiv. Joy? Hi, it's so wonderful to be with all of you and with these fellow panelists. Um, as Delmar mentioned, I'm the Director of Online Education at College of the Canyons. And for us, all of our OER work and our efforts kind of live under my department in online education. So um, we have a small but mighty team of students, current and former uh, students who work directly with our faculty to adopt and create uh, OER. So it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, get to speak about wh why OER is so important uh, beyond cost. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Now I'm going to introduce Kyra. I'm going to do it again through a YouTube channel, and I hope this works. Hello? Can people hear her? her? Okay, great. College of the Canyons graduate. I recently transferred to UC Santa Barbara, but I continue to work for College of the Canyons OER slash CTC department. I format and I organize openly licensed materials for student use. However, as a student myself, I've also had the wonderful opportunity to experience firsthand OER and CTC. Great. Is it fair to say that people were reading instead of listening to that? Okay, 
I'm going to try to figure out how I can amplify the audio. With that, let's get going with the questions. And I need to stop the share. There we go. Okay. So the first question uh, that we have for our panelists is actually back to Kyra. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you have a unique perspective here. On one hand, you help faculty to create OER. On the other hand, you're a student who has taken classes in, with both commercial textbooks and OER materials. When you tell people that you work on OER, how do you explain it? Is there any, Selena, is there any way in order to amplify audio through? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you need to have your actual computer audio needs to be pretty high up. Um, so not just the YouTube audio, but your actual um, computer's audio as well. Okay, I think I did that. We will see how this thing works again. Okay, so with that, we will listen to Kyra's answer to that. Uh, Delmar, it doesn't look like you uh, shared your screen on our end. That is a problem. So with that, I will do that again. I apologize for that. Okay. Everyone can see it? We will listen to Kyra again. When I tell people that I work on OER, I usually begin by defining what OER stands for, Online Educational Resources. Most people are especially curious about what the R or resources includes. So from there, I'll go and explain that resources in this case generally consist of openly licensed materials that are free to use, edit, and share as needed. CTC is especially important to note here. It's actually what I work on most of the time. There's a bit of a zigzag process to developing zero cost textbooks. College of the Canyons, CTC begins with instructor interest before a team helps out to compile, edit, and polish a textbook for them. After an instructor has decided that they would like to help develop CTC for one of their courses, or it usually makes its way down to our CTC team leader, Alexa, who then asks Alex, one of our team members, to find existing and relevant openly licensed materials. We typically look for anything online that is licensed under CC 4.0, as this allows instructors to freely edit or change any of the text or any other included materials if needed. After materials have been found, we compile them onto a Word document before sending it off to the instructor or instructors, who make edits and changes if necessary. It's sent back to Alexa before it eventually makes its way to me. I do most of the aesthetic work, which includes anything from designing covers and graphics to changing header and font sizes. Accessibility is also crucial, as we want to ensure that the book is able to be read on screen readers. After the book is proofread, edited, and formatted correctly, it's sent back to Alexa, where it then ends up on a Google Drive and is free to read, print out, or incorporate into Canvas. All in all, there's a lot of communication involved to create a polished and finished textbook that's completely free for students, like me, to use. Great. Okay, so um, with Kyra done here, uh, first cast question to Angela. As veteran advocate uh, for a, a student success, you've seen the case for OER evolve over the years. Could you share uh, what your elevator pitch was for OER five years ago and what it is today? Yeah, so um, in the earlier days, I would say there's been it was much more of a stronger focus or reliance on the mechanics of OER, like how you openly license materials, what you can do with them as a result, talking about the five R's, you know, retain, reuse, revise, et cetera. And particularly at the higher ed level, we talked a lot about how OER are free for students, which of course continues to be incredibly important. Uh, but now what we're doing is trying to be more intentional to lead with the why of OER and how they're different from other materials, how they benefit students. So we talk more about how OER make it easy to customize everything from a lesson to an entire textbook and how OER can energize students because the content is more relevant and current. And at the same time, I also now acknowledge that if we really want students to become engaged and empowered participants in society, we want schools to become places where students 
feel a greater sense of belonging and connection, we know it's not enough to simply replace traditional textbooks with OER. It matters how these materials are used to create experiences that are relevant and engaging, and it matters how we invite students to show what they know in ways that connect with their lives and communities. And, and so it comes down to making sure students feel agency in their learning, that they feel connected, not just with the content, but also with each other. So now I talk a lot more about these elements of pedagogy and practice when I'm introducing OER to someone new. Thank you. Rajiv, I have the same question. What's your elevator pitch five years ago, or what was it, and what is it now? Thanks, Tamara. Uh, you know, it's interesting, even I'm scribbling away as, as Angela's talking over here, but even the framing of the question is fascinating to me, because five years ago, or you know, maybe 10 years ago, it might have been something closer to an elevator pitch, literally. Uh, but if I could just toy with that metaphor a little bit, if the idea was to get as, as far as we can, or as far as we can with this work as quickly as possible, an elevator and the span of a, of a journey in an elevator car might have been appropriate, but that has shifted, right? So um, similar to Angela, it would have been more focused on, here's what OER are, here's the benefit to students, to faculty, to institutions. For example, we had some emerging data at that point that spoke to those predominantly around the economic, but also the educational impact of OER. Uh, but I think now there's, it's, it's, it's a lot more sort of building a foundation rather than trying to go up in an ele elevator really quickly. And, and part of that is this nuanced conversation. Um, I really don't think it's an accident either that, that this conversation has become more nuanced as the open education community has become uh, a lot more diverse, a lot more inclusive, a lot more intentionally inclusive. And so, for example, you know, some of the nuances that would have, would have been glossed over early on are the questions around things like, well, you know, if you're not thinking about accessibility at the same time as access, what are you really doing? Or if digital redlining is a serious issue, are we really assuming that digital is always going to be the solution? Um, if we are just going to advocate for the creation of OER without thinking about who can afford to forego the extra compensation when it comes to the labor that goes into it. How does this affect the, the, the ideology represented in OER? And so I think, you know, look at the work of people, of people like Cheryl Hutchinson Williams, Sarah Lambert and others. And I think much more of a conversation now about not just doing the right thing, but doing it in the right way and being attuned to not just the economic dimension, but the political and cultural dimensions as well. Thank you, Rajiv. Joy, next question for you. You lead your college's online education department along with supporting faculty who want to use OER. Do you see overlaps between the faculty who teach online and those who use OER? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there certainly are many overlaps. It's not necessarily the case for every faculty member that we work with, but um, you know, I'm always kind of struck by this whole concept of who has access to education who has access to knowledge and in a lot of ways um i think both online classes and oer can be leveraged uh to enable equitable access to learning you know it has to be designed that way thoughtfully designed as uh, rajiv was mentioning um but i think that there's definitely a, a link a very solid link between course design and how we approach designing our learning materials. And by that, I mean, um, considering what content you're sharing with your students and why you're even choosing that. And, and that in and of itself will kind of trickle into how you design um, your course. You know, we talk about sometimes not teaching to the text, but allowing those resources to actually, what knowledge is it that you want your students to know and then building the support around that. So kind of building your coursework around, um, you know, what it is that students are learning and, and perhaps even what it is that they're helping you as a faculty member co-construct. Um, so absolutely, there's there's a really nice kind of relationship there between, at least in my opinion, between online course design and how we go about teaching. Um, and then what is it that we are wanting our students to learn? Whose voices are, are we sharing? What perspectives are we sharing? And um, there's really a nice relationship there be, between them. And I, I see that often in, in my work with um, faculty here at College of the Canyons. Great. Next question is for Kyra. What role can uh, or should students play in advancing OER? 
I'm going to share the screen and this time I'm going to do this correctly. First, student feedback is always great. Personally, as someone who typically does a lot of the formatting, I'm super interested in how easy the books are to read. If there's something that's not able to be read easily, or if there's an error in the editing, it really is helpful to know from other students' perspectives what we can do to improve our developed OER material. Second, students can and should advocate for courses that incorporate OER and especially CTC into the curriculum. No expiring access codes or costly fees, these materials are free to use anywhere, anytime. Enrolling in existing classes that use CTC is a fantastic first step as it shows that there's a demand for OER and CTC. Reaching out to faculty directly is also a great way to help either start OER slash CTC programs at an institution or to show support for their continued development. Wait. Okay. Next question is for Angela. In your role with the Hewlett Foundation, you collaborate with and support open education projects around the world. Are you able to identify any trends and how uh, the case for OER is evolving? Yeah, yeah. So a couple of things come to mind. Um, I'm seeing growing alignment around the idea that open education is not just about creating open resources, but it's really about democratizing learning and building trust and care among educators and students. And I think back to like when I talk to folks who've been in the field like for, for 20 years and they were, you know, there at the very beginning, the early days, I think that's really what it was all about at the very at the beginning. Um, and uh, somehow things got narrowed around resources and textbooks. And now we're, I've seen a broadening and opening up again, which is really nice. And I've seen a greater appreciation that, that OER need to be designed from the very beginning to be responsive to learners' needs and interests, um, seeing greater attention to faculty and staff development around how to incorporate more equitable, even anti-racist practices, um, how to make adaptations that for, with OER that it actually enhance opportunities for learning. And um, I'm encouraged because we have a cohort of about 11 organizations who we fund who are focusing just on this, on this kind of work with faculty and librarians. And another trend I'm seeing is uh, growing recognition that infrastructure is not just about licensing and technology platforms for sharing OER, but the infrastructure. And, and when we talk about creating infrastructure for OER, it's about people and supporting people and creating the space and community to learn and improve practice together. Um, and so that could take many forms like coaching for faculty about how to invite student contributions or recognition of faculty and librarians work through tenure and promotion or thinking about the system and leadership levels, uh, educating the school and system leaders and policymakers so that they can create the conditions for OER to be used in more productive ways and connect it to institutional goals and find ways to secure financial support to sustain open education initiatives. So considering all of this, I'm optimistic that we're moving toward a broader understanding that open education is about creating a culture where students and educators experience care and they discover that, or, or maybe rediscover a sense of joy and purpose in learning. So, um, so, so that's what I'm, I'm seeing in the field now. Thank you. Joy. You're one of the facilitators for the program Open for Anti-Racism, which as its title goes beyond the cost of savings argument. What's the connection between OER and anti-racism? Yeah, thank you. Well, first, I have to thank Angela and the Hewlett Foundation for supporting and funding the Open for Anti-Racism program. Um, to just summarize what it is very quickly, um, and thanks to those of you who joined a session earlier where I got to speak more about it with uh, with Una Daly. Um, the Open for Anti-Racism program, the, the thought behind it and really what we built is um, 
trying to provide a kind of a wraparound system and support system for faculty in the California Community College system who want to um, make their courses more anti-racist. And we did it through the lens of leveraging uh, open education. So OER, open pedagogy, and Rajiv can speak to <laughs> the open pedagogy for sure. Um, but the, the basis of that program is um, really allowing our faculty who move through that program to, to make the connection between uh, open education as, as a tool that can be leveraged to make our teaching and our learning um, anti-racist. So, you know, it's, it's about our, our faculty being able to explore opportunities to personalize and shape the, the, the learning materials for students, but also, and probably more importantly, um, enabling students that opportunity to co-construct and create with their instructors so that they really are a part of the teaching and learning process. Um, you know, Angela mentioned earlier that the concept of students being able to build agency, and that's really what this program is about, is, is how we can leverage open to support students building agency to so that students see themselves as belonging to their learning, not just recipients of it. Um, so really, you know, I, I, I could go on and on, but but I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this connection that we're making and, and that we are moving beyond open um, as cost savings only because, you know, we get to elevate the voices and the experiences and the contributions of you know, marginalized groups that are traditionally left out of the teaching and learning. And um, I, I'm just really excited about the opportunity that open provides for, for us to um, really bring our students in and, and elevate the contributions of others. Great. Thank you, Chair. This is a question to everyone on the panel. Have you seen that OER helps uh, to reduce gaps in success and retention between different student populations? In other words, does OER play a role in reducing the equity gap? First come, first serve. All right, I can jump in certainly. I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think one of the one of the things I love about the conversation about OER is in the years since the initial, you know, quantitative research on, you know, costs and outcomes and use and perceptions and that sort of an, an approach, the wonderful work of, you know, John Hilton and the Open Ed Group at Brigham Young University, is there's been a lot more awareness and, and attention uh, to the intangible benefits. Right. So, for example, what it means for a student when you don't just uh, take a superficial approach to taking advantage of the permissions of open licensing to adapt a book. So it's not just I'm going to chop out chapter five because you don't have to read it. It's not just that you're actually localizing it. You're really even going further and trying to reflect the diversity of your classroom and the curriculum itself. You're trying to push back against the structural academic gatekeeping that we see in terms of what epistemologies are even admitted into the academy. And so, you know, when we look at that, we look at the sort of sense of belongingness uh, that it can create among students who for the first time are seeing their identities reflected. Um, the care that is underlying the message around OER and, and the and of course, the practices of faculty themselves. Uh, and of course, when it comes to faculty members, speaking as someone who supported faculty development for, for a while now, I think there's a special joy I take from seeing and witnessing faculty members, some of whom are not just you know new faculty, who've been in the game for a while, and some, some of them close to retirement even. But the revitalization that you see, the sort of re-engagement with the values that brought them into education itself, the, the discovery of, of a new way of serving or living up to the aspirations and goals that, that brought them to this work. Uh, it's truly, truly magical to see some of that get unlocked. Uh, and so I quite agree with, with the experiences and perceptions that, that Angela and Joy have already shared, certainly. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's this intangible piece and what it means when, as we're trying to actively reshape, reshape elements of an academy that doesn't often do a lot to, to, to live up to its potential and certainly doesn't do a lot to demonstrate care for students. 
Yeah, okay. when I thought about this question, my mind went to a similar place. I mean, there are there are like the some of the tradition or more traditional studies that have been done, and um, and actually the one one of that came to mind was around the University of Georgia study, which um, looked at how it showed OER not only improved grades and reduced withdrawal rates, but they narrowed the gap in academic performance between white and non-white students. So it's it's pretty powerful. But I also think about well, what does this look like across a greater diversity of institutions? And how do we, what does evidence beyond grades and retention look like? And to the points Rajiv was making, I'm very curious about things like, you know, are students getting what they need to feel connected with each other? Like they belong in their class and at their college, in their discipline. And um, and so broadening our, our um, thinking around what, kinds of outcomes we we prioritize when we're um, doing this work in open education. I think that'll be very powerful. Yeah, if, if I may add, um, locally at College of the Canyons, we have utilized data in those more traditional measures of success and retention um, as a way to help us sustain our OER efforts. So we look at that data and we're able to see that our students are succeeding and we are retaining our students at a higher rate in courses that are utilizing OER than those that are not. So um, absolutely, I'm, I'm so in, encouraged and I think it's really important that we think beyond those traditional measures of kind of measuring student success um, and that those more traditional measures can also be potentially leveraged to sustain the, these efforts because, um, you know, again, we, the, the, this work is hard work and um, it, it's difficult, at least, you know, locally, we're always trying to find new ways to fund projects and, um, you know, support faculty who are investing their time and their energy and their effort in this good work. Um, so leveraging data and, you know, your local institutional research team, um, we have found to be successful or helpful for us in sustaining our OER work when, when we can point to the data and see that, that disproportionately impacted students, um, the, the gap is closing when they're in courses utilizing OER. So kind of leveraging data in that way can, can also help from a sustainability standpoint too. Yeah, and if I can add to, to Joy, I mean, your, your, your point over here, I, it resonates with me, but it reminds me of a couple of other things as well. So certainly at my previous institution at Quantlin Polytechnic University, we collected those data, right? We embedded, the, what we would call in Canada, the ZTC course attribute into the timetable, made it searchable for students, and that made it possible to very easily slice the institutional data. So I could tell you semester upon semester, faculty by faculty, here's the gain in enrollment and persistence and completion and performance. Absolutely. Translate that to tuition revenue retained by the institution if you want, by all means, especially if it means that I can lobby to actually support things sustainably. And, and that's the that for me is one of the, the 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 critical points that you just made is is one of the shifts I, I've seen, but I'd like to see continue is this this building kind of database of evidence to demonstrate the impact is at, you know more than just the impact on students. Can it can it move towards a sustainable model? And part of this means giving the people who are dedicated to the work the dedicated time and support to do the work, right? And so the sustainability and care needs to look at the other side of the equation. And I say this because, again, within, the, within an academy that has continued to increase its reliance on precarious labor, we're often turning to the precariat to look after the precarious in terms of students themselves. Uh, and so I think, again, whether it's dedicated positions, OER librarians were not a thing seven years ago, and now they're proliferated. Uh, but sustainable base funded programs that yes you could look at those metrics use them if you need to to understand the the economic argument for the institution uh, but of course you do this so that it is done in the right way and that you're not doing harm with the best of intentions especially for the people who are dedicated and care about this work you're not going to prey on their passions until they burn out and leave uh, and so i think that's the side that i think it can feed back into and it has great <clears throat> Next question is for Rajiv. Many of our attendees know of your work on open pedagogy. Could you tell us what open pedagogy is and how it differs from OER? 
And are there benefits of open pedagogy uh, for students in creating a sense of belonging or for faculty getting back to their core values? Sure, thanks. I'm sorry, I'm giggling over here because uh, if, if you ask Robin DeRosa, my, my uh, partner in crime fighting and, and myself what open pedagogy is, uh, we're not the sort who are have sort of a fetish for definition. So we'll give you a roundabout way of answering it and we'll invite you to think about how to answer it yourself. So I'll give you two potential ways to think about it. One is we think about it as, uh, as an access oriented commitment to learner driven education on the one hand, but it's also a process of using tools for learning and building architectures for learning that do allow students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part and enjoy earlier laid out some beautiful examples of open pedagogy and practice, some of what that means. And so, you know, we've talked about this, we built a website, uh, which uh, perhaps we can throw into the chat as well called the Open Pedagogy Notebook. It's just openpedagogy.org. And it's meant to serve as a space for community to share ideas and examples and practice across different disciplines, whether it's open pedagogy at the course level or the assignment level. But in practice, this is again, harnessing what Joy talked about, the question of agency alongside access. So are we really able to draw on the traditional critical pedagogy, for example, and provide students with much more agency when it comes to you know, influencing the, the, the learning journey itself? Um, you know, whether it's the topics that are being covered, whether it's schedules of work, whether it's course policies, indeed, whether it's assessments themselves, co-constructing knowledge, indeed. Uh, and so when I refer to critical pedagogy, you know, one of the good examples of, of, of that work, and I'm drawing on people like Bell Hooks, for example, but Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator philosopher, described what he called the banking concept of education. And open pedagogy in many ways, and critical pedagogy, of course, is really a reaction to that. Where, where you are not looking at students as the depositories and, and knowledge as a gift that's bestowed upon those who, who you consider to know nothing, for example. It's very much recognizing what expertise means, what learning involves, that the educator is not the only expert in the room, uh, that content is not uh, the, the, the critical part of your identity as an educator, right? And if it were, of course, a MOOC would be entirely an existential threat, right? So you weigh more than just providing content. And students are certainly not empty vessels. And so uh, with open pedagogy, it really is an invitation and, and, and a really explicit intention to try and democratize the learning process, uh, much as Joy has been saying already. Uh, but I'll invite folks to, to check out openpedagogy.org uh, for some examples in practice. Of course, the maybe prototypical example of open pedagogy is what's called the renewable assignment, uh, which is a shift away from traditional assignments where, you know, instructor will will assign it, of course, and students will complete the work, hand it back to the instructor, will be evaluated, and perhaps that, uh, that those comments and feedback will be read by the student, but that's sort of the end of it. It serves the student's skill development, but not much more than that. And with renewable assignments, it's thinking about ways to infuse openness into the teaching and learning process so that typically there's a bigger audience than just the student or the instructor. Typically, it has a longer life than just the semester, and it certainly has a, a deeper, bigger impact. Uh, than just student skill development. Uh, and whether it's you know, moving from classroom presentations to uh, students creating instructional videos, whether it's moving from research essays to students adding and improving articles in Wikipedia, there's a whole host of examples of what open pedagogy and renewable assignments can look like in practice. Great. Thank Delmar, you. Delmar, I just have, I want to add a thought. You know, uh, one thing that I've really appreciated and it's res very much resonates with me and I find quite meaningful is the thinking that Rajiv has done around the connections between open pedagogy and social justice. Um, and there's an article that he and some other colleagues have written, which makes these connections quite explicit. And um, I don't know, Rajiv, if you would say a little bit more about that, but like my takeaway from it is it's really that it, it matters which students we're inviting to, um, to contribute in these ways and being quite intentional about that as well. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I'll maybe try and pop the link to that article in That'd the chat great. as well. Um, I mean, you know, our work, since so this is Mahabali uh, and Catherine Cronin and, um, and myself, we were really building on the work of Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter, who, who, you know, created this beautiful work of scholarship that created a, that, that proposed a social justice framework for OER. We were looking to expand that and apply that to open educational practices more broadly, including open pedagogies. Uh, but but to draw on, on Cheryl and Henry's work, 
they did a couple of things, well, more than a couple of things, but two of the things they did is they, they articulated, you know, the impact on economic, political, and cultural dimensions, first of all, not just economic. Uh, but they also drew on Nancy Fraser's work in social justice to, to, to outline how, well, I mean, you can do good again in a, in a way that is positive, but that is ameliorative, so you're helping. And a good example is economic ameliorative approaches are are what are most common, right? You adopt who we are, you save, stu you save students money, and you're effectively redistributing resources to those who by circumstance have less. This is a positive thing, but it's not addressing the root causes of the inequity in the first place. Uh, or so, you know, so you can go to something that's positive, but it's a little more superficial to something that truly better addresses the root causes of it. So we can create OER, uh, fill those gaps in courses that do not have high quality available OER right now. But if we're again relying on undercompensated or shall we say voluntary labor for educators to actually create that OER, of course, we are in effect recreating the system in terms of the privilege of who, get, who gets to create OER and the ideologies represented. So that's a different, that's an example of the difference between how you can go from ameliorative to transformative, which is the other distinction they make. So um, in that article, which is of course published open access, because you know, otherwise what's the point? Um, we tried to apply that uh, that framework to open educational practices more broadly, with lots of examples to work through. But you know, from our from our mind, you know, and, and again drawing on on some previous work, equity is really something is is for those who are furthest from justice, and so it is critically important to pay explicit attention and be intentional about this. Not just because you can do harm with the best of intentions, but because this movement has a real risk of doing work that is positive, that is good, and feeling very, very, uh, you know, uh, self-assured and comfortable and proud of that work and resting on those laurels while staying away from the really, really difficult work that's the transformative structural changes uh, that perpetuate these inequities. So I'll put the link in the, in the, in the public chat. Thank you. Next question. What does success look like for your work in open education or for the field of open education as a whole? To everyone. I'll jump, I'll jump in. Um, so, you know, I think about this from the perspective of my work at the foundation and actually getting to work with a number of um, people and organizations in the field. So for me, it comes down to really, really three things. You know, I, I want open education programs to be the shining examples of what equitable and, and inclusive instruction looks like so that students experience agency and belonging in school. And I want states and institutions to fund and support open educational policies, resources, practices, research, and I wanna see growing evidence of learning and sharing about what effective practices look like in schools and communities throughout the United States and even around the world. Um, but as we've already kind of talked about today, like it matters how we get there. And to me, it matters if the people we work with are feeling heard and supported and appreciated. And you know, are we having fun doing this work and learning together? Are we helping each other better understand ourselves as we're trying to improve and, and transform education systems. So to me, it's important to stay centered around relationships as we continue in, in this work too. Rajiv, Joy, you wanna jump in on this? Sure, yes. Um, I, I will add just from my perspective locally on, on my campus, um, you know, I think, what success would look like to me is us moving uh, here on my campus, moving from just the concept of OER and ZTC being cost savings and like the kind of conversation that we're having here now, um, that the connection uh, be between that our, that our campus community is making the connection between OER and ZTC enabling um, our coursework to be uh, culturally responsive and 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 more equitable. Um, so I, I think you know we're we're all kind of making this shift together and I, I can see that as an opportunity and we're having those conversations and um, you know we're making those those links but um, 
that's what it would look like here for me uh, because I, I know we've preached enough on campus where our faculty very much embrace and know what OER is and what that means and that's wonderful and and now we have to do the work of taking it a step farther and and continuing to preach the message but but beyond cost um but you know I I'm really fulfilled and I feel very gratified by the opportunity to work on programs like the open for anti-racism program where we get to do that work we get to work alongside faculty to make those connections so so that success is really even just beyond OER it's it's leveraging you know open education and open educational practices um, to be culturally responsive and and how each of us has that opportunity to, to do that so really just continuing this conversation so so the shift continues in in this direction which I feel is a very positive positive Yeah, gosh, <laughs> it's a huge question, Delma. And 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 to be honest, so I I don't think this work is ever going to be done. It should never be done. Uh, we can keep pushing it along, but you know, I would say it's much grander. Um, ultimately, I think what we're talking about is changing the character of the academy at at a quite a grand scale. And in many ways, we're we're talking about you know, putting these little, little bits together. And, and of course, anything we do, even if it's a single instructor adopting OER in a single course with a handful of students, it does have a tangible impact on students' lives. So I'm never gonna discount that. You know, even, even if we're talking about significant cost savings for students though, that's sometimes the most insignificant impact of something like open education. But for me, it's about doing this in a way that is right. And so, and yes, not just in terms of accessibility and inclusion and ethics and platforms and data extraction, thinking about things like that, but it's about making it so that this work isn't the exception. So that it, it does not require somebody to expend the political and social capital that a tenured faculty member has in order to swim upstream to do something that's exceptional. I don't want it to be the case anymore that an instructor who adopts an open educational resource or who invites students to participate in a democratized learning process to get the kind of feedback that tells them that they are the exception, right? That is, it's it's unusual because the academy does not exude care, does not exude care for faculty, does not exude care for learners for that matter, right? Why is it the exception when 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 a student is told, no, I don't need proof that someone in your family has died in order to get an, ex, uh, an extension on your assignment. Why does that have such an outsized reaction? It's because it's the exception for students to be trusted. It's the exception for educators to be supported. It's the exception for the academy to be inclusive. And so for me, this is very much an example and a foray into it, but it's a small slice of the kind of change that I wanna see happen. And of course, the beauty of this work is you do find people who, who, who build that sense of, yes, yes, I remember this. You know, it beats it out of you, the academy sometimes over the years. You forget that spark of what, what makes you, what got you into this work. And so sustainability in a way that is caring, you know, collaboration in a way that doesn't try to just say, well, let's just create OER and let's try and mimic the traditional publishing process by doing it with a single author because we want to, you know, get our name out there and be special and have more hits or, or, or citations. That's not what it's about, right? It's working across those boundaries, much more collaboration within disciplines, much more collaboration across institutions, much more, you know, tell me why, you know, we have to justify in 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 public higher education um uh being able to gather resources in order to do the right thing i would much rather a higher bar a higher threshold be raised in order to be punitive with students in order to charge students money in order to, if you're making educational less equitable that's where the bar should be higher do not interrogate practices that make education more inclusive and then in, and, and then ask harder questions of that so for me, this is a much, much bigger situation. And this is a beautiful way of cutting through that, uh, but it's just the start and, and Lord, and I hope it never ends. That was really big. To transform the academy to that level is uh, uh, 
will require a lot of effort, especially in the R1 institutions that have different sensibilities than uh, non-R1 institutions. Um, I have one question left on my list, but I would like to do a deviation from that uh, because we went over a lot of different topics today. Uh, and I would like to just basically make a cheat sheet. Um, so basically I'd like the panelists to help to create uh, a very short summary of what would be the critical components that OER really brings to the table. Uh, that's non-financial. We can throw financial on there. That's just a single line if you want to do that. Uh, so uh, instead of getting into the finer details about how you want to implement them and, and the benefits of that, what someone can take home and say, OER gives me this, 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 and this. Um, and I will, um, if you like, I can start, or uh, if one of you have already an idea behind it, we can let you guys uh, uh, take the ball and run. Well, maybe we can just all each brainstorm a few ideas and see where this this takes us. Um, you know, I'm thinking about greater flexibility and agency for for faculty and students as one piece. Like we all we all talked about that, um, and. Um, OER certainly enables that. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion, but um, but it it, it's an, it can be an enabler um, when when used that way. So let's separate those two, if we may. Uh, flexibility and customization is one thing. Agency is a different thing. Uh, can you uh, uh, define the two? Yeah, that's that's a big question too. But like for flex flexibility, I mean, there are the technical elements of flexibility that come with like the license choices and, you know, if they're digitally available and how, how they can be sort of adapted and customized and reshared. Um, but there's also the creativity of it too, that I think is in the spirit of what open education is about. And I'm you know, thinking about what um, Rajiv was talking about, about like educators, faculty, like reconnecting with that joy that brought them to the profession and that sense of self about um, why they they love teaching and connecting with others and um, and so there's it's that I mean I guess that's for me where the flexibility sort of connects in with agency it's um, there's so the agency it's, of the of the of the instructor of, of the uh, instructor to, to, to as, pursue his or her goals yes and agency of the student and I I mean I think Joy and Rajiv could speak to both these things too so I hope they add but agency of um, of students as well to um, find ways to co-create or to create or to um, it bring their experience, their lived experiences um, and and ideas to shape what um, what learning looks like. So um, so that's that's how I'm. That's the dimension of agency that I'm thinking of. Great. Rajiv's smiling, so that means he has something to say. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I was hoping Joy would jump in, but yeah, no, I agree. I mean, you know, <laughs> pedagogical flexibility by all means, right? So. That's an easy one for faculty, just in terms of this shift away from, again, the ludicrous status quo where people bend their courses to map onto the table of contents of a textbook, you know, to something where you can actually adapt uh, your materials to, to serve your, your pedagogical outcomes. That's great. Uh, agency for students you talked about, uh, you know, not going to skip past the equitable access for students, of course. Um, for institutions, I would add, you know, if you look at vision and mission statements, I think it's hilarious because most of the time it's like buzzword bingo over there. But you know, the ability to live up to those ideals a little bit more um, is is not a bad thing. Um, and and to the extent that the nature of the academy, which you know, in general, right, there are lots of exceptions, of course, um, is 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 in some ways maybe a reflection of of um, or a or, or a um, yeah, I mean, it's a reflection. It's it's a representation, I think, of the extent to which people have been traumatized going through the system. And we think about this is how it always needs to be. It's a softening of those boundaries. It's it's a um, it, it's the I think injection of care into the academy in some sense in terms of culture. I, I th there are a lot of things that were mentioned here that. Uh, uh, I would say are all folded into the ability to uh, edit uh, or uh, 
and customize our content. Um, so the ability in order to build the agency, and it comes with the ability to edit the content, or as some people mentioned, uh, you know, academic freedom from, uh, I presume, publishers uh, or the single tome of knowledge that's out there. Uh, but there are also other aspects that I'm particularly uh, excited about, which is localization. Um, the ability in order to build a book that is connected to the locale, which essentially activates the same identity uh, aspects that culturally responsive pedagogy comes in with. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to mobilize that, but that's one aspect of that. There are probably many other aspects that fall into that category. Um, I'm not sure if you guys want to chime in on that aspect or if there are other components of uh, OER that you want to discuss in this cheat sheet that I'm kind of putting together here. Well, I would add, and I think this kind of falls under a, a lot of what's already been mentioned, but um, I'm really struck by and encouraged by the opportunity that OER presents for uh, revealing a broader truth or history, even about a specific discipline than maybe uh, typically is represented in in learning or in a textbook. Um, so, you know, again, kind of going back to like whose contributions are even featured, who, whose voices are being elevated and who is left out, um, which then ties into our, our students really feeling like they can belong to their learning rather than just receive the learning because I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, if, if we can reveal and expose to students and they can be a part of the process of uncovering who has built, you know, the disciplines that we're learning, um, there are so many more contributions and contributors and, and voices that, that construct all that is that we're sharing with, with our learners and OER enables us to, to elevate those contributions and elevate those voices. Um, which I think is really, really important. Uh, otherwise, we're just perpetuating the same inequities, uh, whether it has an open license on it or not. So um, it, it, I think, that, but that ties into, you know, a lot of what Rajiv and Angela were saying earlier about doing the work, but being really thoughtful that we're, we're doing it in a way, um, I think Rajiv said that communicates care rather than um, doing this in a harmful way. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm really encouraged by how OER enables us to to uh, broaden who who is even who has the seat at the table, whose voice is being shared and heard. Yeah, and Delmar, maybe one other piece. Just speaking as an OER OER author creator myself for a moment, I'm reflecting on this because one of the most enjoyable, entertaining things about OER is is you have no idea what's going to happen once you publish OER, right? You, just the, the downstream adaptations, derivations, the impact is unforeseeable in, in, in the most delicious way. So, uh, you know, when, when you have, you know, for some of the open textbooks I've helped work on, you know, editions that have sprung up in different corners of the world, translations. So, so I would say, you know, in terms of a feature, again, it's, it's one of these things. It's a gift that keeps giving and it gets more dear each time it's re-gifted effectively. It's glorious. So it's this beautiful, beautiful force of good that, that gets a little more uh, loud um, and gets into different channels uh, the longer it's out there. Personal affirming of the, uh, of the instructors. That's great. Oh. I was just going to say, you know, I, I love so much, too, what Joy was and Rajiv have both been sharing about the broadening the history of a discipline and whose knowledge is um, is reflected and um, and what assumption. It's not just about the knowledge that's there, but how we how, how it's been created. And so I, I just think there's a lot that that OER opens up. And, and, and around that piece. And then I also wanted to just expand upon an idea that uh, Rajiv had shared around um, allowing institutions to live up to their ideals and, so, and sort of these um, words like diversity, equity, and inclusion that are um, sort of baked into a lot of mission statements um, these days. And I do really see OER, open, open education resources and practices as a way um, to put those into practice. Um, and um, and I think there, there are folks like the um, group at uh, AAC and U and their OER Institute who are helping leaders make these kinds of connections. So um, I think that's great work. 
Great. Okay. Um, uh, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to see if we can get a handful of words for this last final question for everybody. Uh, what's next for open education? What do you see on the horizon in the next few years? You know, we sort of discussed this, uh, but uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Um. Well, when I think about this question, I you know, end our conversation today um, just reflecting on how it's not OER's or open education's not a grassroots movement anymore, and um, and uh, where we've just got a few faculty and librarians leading the charge. It's really gaining interest among um, state and school leaders, and and I'm hopeful about the headway that's being made around this, both in the state of California, but also through collaborations across the states, again, to, with the idea of um, thinking about infrastructure in terms of people and sustainability in terms of building our shared capacity and understanding and commitment to this work. And so, um, you know, I'm encouraged by work like the, there's a group of state system leaders. It's like 28 states now that they're called, they call themselves the doers because they, they take action, but it stands for driving OER sustainability for student success. And, um, and they meet regularly and share practices. And, um, and then there, there are groups like the regional compacts, like Gucci that work with the Western states who are helping to share effective practices. So that gives me hope that, that we're, there's coordination uh, among layers of the ecosystem that hopefully can push in the directions that we're talking about today. Um, so um, that's that's one thing I wanted to, to share. I'm curious about what Joy and Rajiv are thinking. Well, um, I, I think the fact that we're having a conversation like this now gives me hope for what's to come in the future as as we continue this conversation and this effort in this movement, you know, as Angela mentioned, we're kind of beyond a grassroots movement. Um, but again, really making the important link and connection um, and, you know, between being culturally responsive and, and enabling our teaching and learning to be to be equitable. But I, I think also um, what I hope, I don't know, but I hope that what's to come is, uh, again, that we move away from buzzwords towards actually doing the work. You know, it's kind of um, like we, I, I approach it when when faculty, when we're developing coursework to, to or an online course, if you leave accessibility as an afterthought and you're, or you're designing OER, but that's an afterthought, who who are you designing it for? Who Who is that for? So, I really hope that when we think about OER or open education, we we think of the opportunities to to build to make to make our teaching and learning equitable and responsive. Not because those are really catchy buzzwords, but because that should be like built in, baked in the foundation of all that we do and all of the work that we do. So, um, I'm I'm happy that we're having these conversations, and I hope that it continues us moving forward uh, where, where that link just becomes a natural part of th this work that we approach and that we do uh, rather than an afterthought or um, something that we try to do because it, I don't know, it, it, it makes us feel good and it's the thing to do. It's about doing the right thing and, um, and, and ultimately that, that serves our students. So, um, that's what I hope for the future. Well, I, I'll, I, that's a beautiful way to put it. Um, it's lots of little small things, but you know, we're all at different points as well, right? There are some institutions, some individuals, many who are coming to this work for the first time. So in terms of the future, we're already at a point where certainly in North America, more than 50% of faculty are aware of OER to a reasonable degree. We're already at a point where about a third, if not more, of courses are using OER, particularly at the introductory first year level, for example. So of course, those gains will continue to be made. Um, of course, there will be more resources developed, of course, you know, for those who want to continue to, to draw on a model that is more sort of textbooky, 
and I will reserve my comments about that particular pedagogical approach anyway, uh, those resources will get more interactive, there will be more ancillaries, there will be more vertical integration, more ZTC programs. I'll stretch my tongue and say that. Uh, they will, I, I think what I love about, Angela, when you refer to the, the system-wide collaboration is what I certainly see happening a whole lot more. And you know, groups like the Open Education Network have been doing incredible work, uh, not just nationally, but internationally, to, to build that community, to build local capacity. And I think that's a key element of it, is moving away from this sort of, you know, the temporary benefit of outsourcing uh, some of these things to whether it's an OPM or something else. It, it reminds me of that sort of preying off uh, preying on the desire for convenience for faculty, which has led uh, certainly for the commercial, to the commercial textbook publishers creating quizzing platforms where students have to pay in order to complete their homework, for example. So, so a lot more collaboration, a lot more capacity development within institutions, um, uh, and a lot more integration even within institutions. You know, a lot of places have already done this, weaving it into policies, procedures, practices, whether it's tenure and promotion policies, places like uh, the University of British Columbia that have done that, curricular policies or IP policies, you know, some of those key, key kind of uh, systemic issues. Uh, but especially, I would say, a continuation of the critical conversations, foregrounding of justice, inclusion, attention to the political and cultural dimensions, uh, real efforts to go beyond ameliorative, uh, uh, ameliorative approaches to more transformative approaches. Um, and, and perhaps as that continues, um, you know, these critical conversations will get beautifully complicated and nuanced. Um, and, and, you know, it, it always makes me laugh when, when, when people sort of look at critical conversations and say that, oh, you know, this, this divisiveness, this conflict. No, this is critical thinking now. So, you know, the fact that not everything that could be open should be open. Maybe you're thinking about traditional knowledge now. That the, digi that the digital is not always the solution. Maybe, you're, maybe you've come upon the reality of digi digital, digital redlining for the first time. I mean, this is really good stuff. So I would say, you know, the normalization of that criticality is going to be central to, to this expansion and collaboration work if it's going to be a successful future. Great. Thank you, Rajiv, uh, Angela, Joy, for a beautiful conversation here. So we have another 10 minutes left before uh, this period is over. So if people uh, would like to ask questions, since I can't see the audience in this uh, uh, this infrastructure, please add them to the uh, path of bold question list off of there. Um, I'm going through and cutting through here. Let me ask just one question on my own. Since you, you mentioned the term digital redlining several times, Rajiv, can you actually clarify that, please? Certainly. I'm going to try also and bring up a link and I'll paste it in the chat. I'm referring, you know, I'm really influenced by the work of Chris Gilliard over here, uh, who, of course, drew on the on the reality and the history of, of redlining in, in, in places like Detroit, for example, where it was intentionally made uh, very difficult to impossible for, for example, uh, uh, Black families to, to successfully get um, um, loans for homes, for example. And it, literally, you know, you could take the city of Detroit as an example <laughs> and, and a street on one side of which uh, was, was more heavily populated uh, by, by Black families and the other was not and the really, really disproportionate rates in which uh, that kind of systemic support. So sort of racist systemic practices in terms of financing. But over here, he's talking more about the ways in which the digital divide, shall we say, is is reinforced, is upheld, is intertwined. So, I mean, I think the, the, the experience of the pandemic is, is really a good illustration of some pieces of this, right? When those early days, March of, whatever year it was at this point, I can't remember, 2020? Mm -hmm. um, when people had to pivot, when it was unsafe to be on campus in many different contexts, and, and suddenly it was like, well, yeah, no problem, we can, we can move online. Um, I, you know, does everybody have a device at home? Does everybody have reliable broadband internet at home? If you are requiring your students to, oh God, this is getting into even IKEA waters, uh, you know, purchase a webcam at a point where jobs were scarce to find, where webcam prices were higher than ever in order to perpet perpetrate surveillance technology, in order to stave off your own mistrust of students. You're going to have to shut me up here, Dalmar. Um, I mean, these are all points, you know, in over the last couple of years where the reality that, that so many individuals for the first time began to realize that, oh, 
So I cannot assume that uh, that all of my students are so-called digital natives, whatever the heck that means. Um, okay, you know, let me but, shut but, you but, up. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'll, so I'll put a link into the chat, but really thinking about it in terms of, you know, racial divides in particular. Great. Thank you. Um, this is a question that Suzanne asked uh, on here. Uh, I, she'd like to hear more about uh, the, the question about integrating with traditional academic approaches, you know, such as publishing. Um, so which is a more effective approach, integration or disruption? And I'm not entirely sure if integration means working hand in hand uh, in order to move forward or fighting the system, which I presume is what uh, she's referring to. Or let me let me modify that question slightly. So there's a general interest that's expressed in this panel um, in in terms of trying to change the academy which is a large effort uh, that we need to be done. Uh, what is the best way in order to do that? So right now we're putting out fires here and here and here. So how do we actually do this large scale catastrophic, uh, uh, massive disruption uh, that Rajiv dreams about here? Too big of a question. Well, I I was you know I'm actually curious about what Joy said because I was thinking well like she's actually doing it at her institution and in the role that she's in I mean that's that's it it's about um, you know starting with people again and um, uh, and it's not always something that and I think patience. Um, I think we live in a culture that expects um, quick change and quick returns. And um, it's about patience and taking step by step. Um, well, I guess that's an incrementalist sort of approach to it. And there could, I, I'm, I'm curious if, if Rajiv or Joy, like think about a more, a more disruptive kind of like scrap things and start from the beginning, but um, but it seems like we're we're seeing at least some some progress with um, with some of the you know let's keep bringing people or bringing people to the table and um, and opening up the conversation and uh, and to keep the work moving forward. So um, yeah, yeah. Gosh, this is such a tough question. Um, you know, I don't. I'm, I'm with you, Rajiv. I'm part of the revolution. I don't have the plan yet for how we're going to do it. <laughs> but what I will say is, um, you know, I think it just it, it's it requires a shift, which often takes time. And as Angela was saying, is not may not be immediate. But um, th this shift in like who we even refer to as knowledge keepers or holders, um, and by that, I mean, I, I think we we perpetuate that concept that there's like one single keeper of the knowledge because then you have to buy it by owning this textbook. Or even if we openly license it, that the knowledge only lives or exists because it's been created here by this particular person in this particular way. Um, so it's this shift towards who who we even deem like the, the keeper or the knower of, of the knowledge. Um, but also I think it's it's built into the, the again, the the academy and our, our system, our approach to, you know, I, I think of tenured faculty who feel who must be publishing, you know, to and and this requirement or this expectation that we sometimes hold of a faculty that they they must publish and therefore that that's the only way that they sort of validate their their position um, and it, it validates the knowledge that that they perpetuate but it's like an undoing of of how we have built this system um, and you know a, another thing in, in terms of just you know building this process so that it can be sustainable but also communicate care which is what Rajiv was saying earlier um, you know just this whole concept of the exploitation of, of our adjunct faculty, 
that in and of itself is exploitative. And then we ask them to do this hard work and do this great work. Um, it, it's like it's a it's a redoing of, of how how we sustain um, the academy and and the people who are doing the work. So um, I I don't know what's more effective, but um, I I just personally seek ways that we can keep doing this work sustainably and 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 do it in a way um, that that honors the the work and the time and the effort of of everyone who's contributing and who's who is creating um, this learning and and just providing opportunities for all of us to be able to contribute to the learning and, and knowledge so. I rambled a bit. My brain's going like a bunch of different directions. <laughs> That's a very complex uh, issue. Um, we okay. are at time, uh, unless uh, you, anyone has a desire in order to express some short uh, concluding thoughts, uh, I'd like to close out the panel. Rajiv, any short concluding <laughs> thoughts? I know that's hard. Just a lot of gratitude. Honestly, it's a wonderful conversation. And I just want to recognize that the work that is happening, and even if we don't see it yet, it is happening classroom by classroom, institution by institution, right? And it's real work. It is real change. Great. Angela Joy. Should I say Joy, Angela? Okay, I'm putting you on the spot here, so I apologize. Um, with that, uh, let's thank the panelists again. I'm not entirely sure how we can thank them in this webinar. A lot of virtual claps. Uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in this conversation. There was a lot of interesting topics that came up uh, and certainly a lot to uh, digest over a period of time. Um, so thank you very much for attending, uh, all the participants. And I encourage you to uh, keep in mind the topics that were discussed today uh, in the subsequent uh, sessions of uh, Cal OER this year. Thanks again, everyone.